Uh, and that speaker view will allow you to see who is speaking at the time. And uh, there's also a way we see all of the tiles. So uh, feel free to do what makes you comfortable, how you like to see things that are going on. Um, that's completely fine. Do whatever is comfortable for you. We will ask that everyone stay muted um, throughout just so we don't have any background noise or echoing. And we have some pre-submitted questions. However, if anyone has any questions that pop up during the Yappy Hour, please feel free to use the chat box to submit those questions. And I will be monitoring that chat box and I will um, be able to relay those questions from you to our various uh, panelists. And um, as I mentioned with the camera, um, feel free to have it on or off, uh, whatever makes you happy. And then last thing, uh, we will be, and we are currently, recording this session as well so that we can send it out to those that weren't able to make it today uh, and just have an archive because it's not often that we get to have so many animals in one spot. I love this. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, um, to Scott uh, for a little more of an introduction. All right, thank you, Andrea. Can everyone hear me okay? Like a couple thumbs up if I, I'm generally, I think probably too loud rather than not loud enough. So I will, I will just stick with that. And just wanted to thank all of you for taking the time today to, to join us. You are the ones who make this incredible work possible. You know, we could not do the work that you're about to hear without your help. Uh, today's presentation is gonna be all about our, our TLC work and this is that special work that we perform to make animals more treatable and to get them into homes. Some of it is related to our behavior work. Some of it is related to our medical work. Uh, it's not always pretty. I'll just warn you right now that we're gonna get into some things that you know we get gruesome injuries and we've got some hard cases. It's not always pretty work, but I can assure you that the endings are pretty special. Um, today's focus is going to be on dogs and cats, um, but I want to let you know that our TLC work is not limited to dogs and cats. It encompasses the work that we do to make horses better, to make rabbits better, guinea pigs, other domestic animals that we get in and we treat and we make better. But for today, we're gonna focus on dogs and cats. Um, I like to, to describe how our animals arrive to us. You know, they come to us either as strays or owner surrenders for the most part. And I like to break it down into three categories as when the animals, conditions they arrive in. So some of them, not many, arrive perfectly healthy. That means there's absolutely nothing that we need to do to make them better. We need a spot on the adoption floor for them to be, to be adopted. There aren't many animals that come to us that way. Um, these are the animals that every shelter in the world should be able to do some, to, to have a positive outcome for. On the other end, there are those animals that there is no amount of work possible, given our resources, that we could do to make them better. Those are the real sad cases. And you, you can probably imagine animals that are hit by cars and have multiple broken bones, head injuries, internal injuries. Um, the animals just arrive so broken. Um, animals that, are, that, that have been involved in you know, serious attacks on family members. Um, that's on the other end. Again, we have the ones that are perfectly healthy on one end. See if I can see my hands. And on the other end, the ones that there's no amount of work in the world that we can do to make them better. In the middle, there's a big group of animals that arrive in our care and we consider them treatable. That means they have something going on that's preventing them from being adopted, but we feel we can treat it to make them better. And that's really where our focus has been over the last four years, four plus years, our organization's focus has been on that middle group, making as many of those animals, those treatable animals, better so we can rehome them. Now, this work is not, um, does not happen in every shelter. Some shelters avoid it altogether. Um, if they're really, really selective in the animals they admit, they can avoid the really difficult work. And some shelters do that because that work costs money, um, it takes time, it requires having specialists on staff, both behavior specialists and medical specialists, 
and it's emotional work. You, you see really the worst of the worst, the hardest cases, and you can't make them all, every single one of them better. So some shelters just avoid it altogether. We're not that kind of a shelter. We're an open admission shelter, meaning we take in all the animals that come to us. Um, I mentioned this has become an organizational focus the last four plus years, and we've made incredible strides. There was a time not that long ago where about half the animals that came into our care had a positive outcome. The last few years, between eight and nine out of every 10 animals that come into our care have a positive outcome. And that includes all those animals that I mentioned, even the ones that we know there's nothing we can do to make them better. So to have a positive outcome for between eight and nine out of every 10 is incredible. And we've been able to do that because we've increased our resources. We've increased our staffing in the key areas. Um, in one area, we actually had to walk away from a program uh, that already existed. And that's hard for a nonprofit to do. Um, more than four years ago, we had a program that we felt was a, it was a nice program, but it focused a little bit outside of our mission. And it was a program that was, uh, you know, special like all of our programs. This one was uh, managed by our, our behavior staff. And we walked away from that program in order to redirect our behavior staff to those animals that really needed their time in the shelter. So it's not the easiest thing for a nonprofit to do, but it was the right thing for us to do. And we, we again, devoted more resources to that program. So now I have the pleasure of turning it over to my colleagues who make all this incredible work happen. But I will thank you once again for doing what you do to make it happen. And I think we are gonna lead off with Dr. Elnita Connors, who is our Chief of Shelter Medicine. Dr. Connors, all yours. Okay, thank you, Scott, and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could join us to hear a little bit about our TLC program. Um, I'm hoping that either Andrea or uh, Stacy is able to bring our photos up. The first animal that I'm going to talk about today is a dog named Lucy. And um, if you had seen um, the, the gallery view, Amanda was playing with Lucy in her office. Uh, Lucy came to us as a surrender in late September. And she was surrendered because um, of a skin problem, and that was just too expensive for her, um, for her owners to manage. And Andrea, we're looking at your beautiful family. <laughs> oh, you gave the pictures? Um, oh, shoot. Yeah, the pictures flashed up very briefly. Uh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let me get out of here um, and let me get it to Stacy. So, Dr. Connors, just keep keep going okay um from a distance so so um lucy there she is pretty girl so she's at about a six-year-old female spay pit bull mix dog um and from a distance i thought when i looked at her she looks like she's had a chemical burn on her face um and that's not unusual unfortunately we do see that but as I got closer, I saw that it was not a burn. It was some sort of infection and inflammation um, in a very unusual pattern and distribution. This dog has virtually no other skin problems than what we see there on her face. Um, so I put her on um, two broad spectrum antibiotics for about two weeks, but we saw minimal change. And the photo that you're looking at right now is, is kind of one of the worst. Um, she actually got worse after, after she got here and we started treating her, which was a little disheartening. But um, we decided to take a biopsy of different areas of the skin on her face and uh, the pathology report came back telling us that she has an allergic problem as well as she had a deep bacterial infection. So um, by allergy or allergic, what I'm referring to is a syndrome in dogs and cats, but it's much more common in dogs called atopy, 
or atopic dermatitis. And this is a hypersensitivity, and it's typically genetic in basis, um, to food and or environmental allergens. Um, it's usually not one. Um, there are usually many allergens involved, and, and it's usually almost impossible to find out what a dog is allergic to. Um, back in when I was in private practice, I used to tell my clients, they're just allergic to anything and everything. So um, what were we going to do with, with Lucy? Uh, well, first of all, we started treating her with a very heavy-duty antibiotic, which served double duty because during this time, Lucy developed a nasty urinary tract infection. So um, we started that, but we also started a medication uh, called Atopica. Now you'll notice that I said she has atopic dermatitis and Atopica is the medication that we're using. Um, there's a reason for that. It is the gold standard that we use to treat dogs with this condition. Um, it is cyclosporin. If uh, some of you are familiar with generic names for things, um, cyclosporin is very commonly used in human medicine for a number of things, um, including chemotherapy and, and organ rejection. Um, it is an immune system suppressant drug. We, com we combine that with another drug called ketoconazole, which is an antifungal drug. And we do that because ketoconazole lets us lower the dose of atopica that we're using so that we have fewer side effects. So Lucy's been on atopica and ketoconazole now for about a month. And um, we also have her on a special diet, a hydrolyzed protein diet for potential food allergies because that may be part of the mix. Now I'm gonna just take a segue here for a minute because there was a question submitted that I'd like to address now. Um, and that was, what kinds of medical problems do we treat here at the SDCA? Um, and I'll, I'll say that we treat a lot of very challenging things and things that encompass every organ system in an animal's body, um, neurologic, orthopedic, endocrine, uh, wounds, infections, pretty much you name it, at some point in time in, in the space of a year, we're going to see it. But most commonly, the most common thing that we treat in our dogs and cats is flea allergy dermatitis, um, something that fortunately these days is fairly easy to treat. In kittens and cats, upper respiratory infections and diarrhea are the most common things that we treat. And in dogs, diarrhea and skin problems, both acute and chronic, such as what we're treating in Lucy. Now the challenge for treating these chronic and unusual skin cases like Lucy's is that it can take months for them to show improvement. Um, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and, and sometimes we can make a certain amount of progress and we have to hope that we can get the animal adopted into a good home where the owner can then take what we've done and, and go to a private veterinarian and continue that treatment. We were very lucky just recently, we had a Yorkshire Terrier who was in our foster care program for about six weeks um, while we were treating her skin issues. She was adopted by a wonderful owner who sent me an email about a week later with the entire plan with her veterinarian to continue to treat her dog's skin problems. Um, so that, that was fabulous. Um, fortunately for Lucy, uh, she is improving and uh, we will continue with her current medications. And we are very grateful that we have Amanda our behavior and training department manager, who is fostering Lucy. And I think um, Amanda is going to show us a little bit of Lucy live. All right, sorry. I'm trying to get myself unmuted there. 
So Lucy's ear, sorry, her tail gets a little loud against the wall here. Um, so I don't know if we can see Lucy, her face is really doing well. We're getting hair coming back. It's one of the things that we're hoping to see with Lucy um, on there. And it's one of those things when we talk about doing a long-term foster, it is something that we at the shelter have a hard time finding fosters for or large breed. Um, older dogs, puppies and kittens, typically get, we have fosters who come that day as soon as we have them and get them, but it can be a little bit more challenging to find somebody who's willing to take on a large dog for months on time. And it's something that I've been very blessed to do. And we do have other staff and other volunteers who do that too, which has been really rewarding to do. And I know many people often ask, you know, how did, what keeps you from having, you know, keeping them? And it, you know, it's going to be hard when Lucy is all well and, when, and probably in another month. So we'll have her for about three months in our home. But knowing that we'll be able to get her into a home and get her loved and be able to move on so she can have the life that she deserves, because she definitely deserves to be loved and have her own family. And that's one of the things that we've seen, you know, even though Lucy has not felt the greatest, has been going through a lot, her spirit has been amazing. Uh, it's one of the things that we see. She's always happy to see us, to be with our other dogs, to see the staff, to meet new people. And it's you know, really a rewarding thing. And then what's gonna happen in a few months is there'll be another foster. <laughs> and that's what kind of what keeps us going. You know, we want to be able to keep doing this because every time I have one like Lucy, they always ask her, how are you gonna give her up? Um, you know, I know she's gonna get a great home and I will always keep in contact with those people just like I have with the previous ones I've had and we'll keep on helping the next one that comes in. And that's, you know, really, for us, being able to do that is huge. And to see a dog like Lucy go full circle is really important for us on there. And, you know, it's one of those things that we see being in the community, you know, being able to see these animals get homes. I you know, wasn't too long ago, I was at the beach and I had a dog run up on me, you know, charging, come and say hi owners coming behind me yelling you know, the dog trying to stop and apologizing as you know she's telling me and I'm you know I'm so sorry the dog never does that I'm like it's okay Jackson I know Jackson well you know this is a dog that we had at the shelter and he, you know and the fact that, that he would come up and run across the the beach to say hi as he saw me really told us that we're doing our job you know, he was happy to see somebody he remembered for about probably about five months before when he had been adopted. And he was wanting to say hi and see us. You know, he, we did what we were supposed to do when he was at the shelter and made him feel safe and loved to the point where he was able, until he was able to get adopted. And, you know, those are the things that we are always looking at doing in our department. Um, we had a dog recently who came in that was, a very sweet dog but she was a backyard dog who was kind of different to most of the people that would come to take her out she people really had have value you know that she didn't see the point of interacting with them she didn't was kind of one way or the other with people we worked really hard for a few weeks to get her to build that bond to start seeing that interaction as we started seeing that we were able to make her for available for adoption we started getting her, you know, appointments and people kept kind of passing on her because she wasn't doing that interaction of people wanting to, you know, play with because she just kind of walk away from them. So we kind of really worked on that. And then we finally found somebody who was willing to take the time to work with her, understood what we were telling them about her, kind of showing her how they started, how she was affiliating with us. And, well, I think about last week, we had an email from her with this dog sitting on her couch, curled up in a blanket, and the dog was so happy. And it was one of those things that, you know, we finally saw that this dog felt, had seen value in people. You know, this dog finally found out that people, you know, meant something and that she was able to be loved by somebody. And then again, it gave us, you know, what, we, what we're here for you know, be able to help the dogs feel safe, build those bonds and get them into a home and to be able to see them move on to their next life and be a cherished family member. And that's, you know, one of the things that I look forward to with Lucy and the next ones that come through. 
um, you know, with the long-term fosterings, it's bittersweet. We'll see. It's always hard to say goodbye to them, but we know they will be loved and we'll be able to help them in the next dog. On there, I think I didn't hear more to see. <laughs> so if I can just um, add on to what Amanda was saying, um, as, as she said, it's so gratifying for us to see us be able to work with these dogs, whether it's a medical problem or a behavioral problem, or a lot of times it's both. And um, uh, Amanda and I and our two departments work very closely with each other because we will. We will have dogs who have medical problems who also will have a behavioral need. Um, and so as Scott was saying earlier, there just aren't that many shelters where there's, there's medical staff working with behavior professionals to make sure that our animals are being addressed as, as a whole picture. We're not just, you know, as, as a veterinarian, I'm not just focused on the animal's medical problem. I'm also concerned about their level of stress when they're here in the kennel or um, they're, they're needing enrichment. And so we feel that we are very, very lucky to have um, our donors supporting our TLC program, which allows us to work so closely together to make sure that the animals are getting the best care possible. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I, it's been a, just a joy to see Lucy's progression through all of this and um, hearing the tail flap along the wall, just so, such a comforting sound to me, oddly enough. Um, so something that I love that Scott mentioned is he talked about the fact that we're not just working with uh, dogs, but we've also added cats to the mix. So we're gonna come over to um, our shelter manager, Jenny, with a very special guest of Cinderella. And then uh, Jenny, I'll let you introduce her first and then I'll throw some pictures up of her. Is she too busy napping? You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I didn't you unmute okay. before turning. Yes, Miss <laughs> Cinderella, she can't be bothered right now. Um, <laughs> She's named after a princess for a reason. I've, I've found out after hanging out with her for some time now. She wasn't super happy when she came back from foster care for this meeting, but now she's purring up a storm and she's been running all over my desk. So do you wanna, will you throw up um, her intake photos for me? So everybody can see what this little girl looked like when she came in. So this is Cinderella. Um, she is a little six-month-old um, kitten that came into us as a stray from the city of Seaside. Um, clearly, when she came in, um, she was looking pretty rough. Um, she had that the dark spots on her face is road rash. Um, so we do think she got hit by a car. Um, can you show the next photo, please? So when she came in, not only did she have the road rash to her face, if you look at the top foot in this picture, um, it's turned around backwards. Um, her leg should not look that way. Um, it was badly broken um, when she was hit. So um, we did have to amputate her leg. Um, luckily, we have a fabulous vet team here who was able to do that surgery in-house. Um, and after her surgery, we were able to then place her um, into foster care while she, you know, learned how to walk again on three legs. This is her once her face healed up. Um, and she's actually, she's in um, a foster home right now with another three-legged kitty um, that was actually adopted from us a few years back. So she's, she's learning the ropes from a, um, from somebody who's been through it themselves. Um, she, she is actually quite a spry little kitty, um, quite active, and she will, she um, has about another week of recovery um, after her surgery. This was her this morning. She was a little grumpy this morning. <laughs> um, so she'll be with us probably for another week in foster care. 
and then she will be placed up for adoption. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Sorry that Cinderella had to nap on you, but you know, when you got to do it, you got to do it, right? I like how she even pawed at you like, no, madam, I can't. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. So we're going to head back to Amanda. Um, and we're going to see another very special dog. Uh, so Amanda, I'm going to spotlight you and go ahead and into our Red's Barn area, which um, used to actually be our barn for the barn animals. When we did our remodel our, and, and reinvented the new shelter, we actually were able to utilize this barn area for our dogs who are on the special needs. Um, and by special needs, it kind of varies on what they what those needs are sometimes the dogs are on the shire side sometimes the dogs are on the hyperactive over the top side and that is actually one of the dogs that we have right here this is rex rex was surrendered to us along with another husky which we have been seeing a huge influx in huskies lately um and with rex he came in with another one the guy found them on craigslist um, and found out that they were a little bit more than, than he thought they, could, they were able you know, to handle. And so they surrendered him and we were able to get the other dog that came in with him adopted, but Rex has been a little bit more challenging. He is definitely a husky and full personality and you have to keep him busy or else he will find himself something to do. Um, and so one of the things that we've been really working on with him is training. And as you see, we got Jamie and Anna right here doing some hand touches and teaching him to focus. I will tell you when Rex Rex came in, focusing was not something he did ever. <laughs> he was more interested in running around the yard and playing keep away. Um, so we had a lot of work that, to do with him to get him to this point. <laughs> he said he was gonna find that treat. Um, and what we were, you know, one thing, you know, Jamie's working on is dropping it, but she's also working on him not jumping up, which is something that Rex really likes to do on there. So, you know, giving Rex the foundation, and that's what we've been working on, because Rex, unfortunately, has been adopted, but he was returned because the people were overwhelmed with him. So we are working hard on continuing that training, and we're going to work hard on finding that home who's going to be ready for him. So right now we got basically is a a 10 and this is one of the games that we'll play for enrichments for the dogs so basically to keep them busy and figure things out we have um some treats hidden in there so he has to find them one's a snuffle mat and one's the tin with the balls but i think he thinks this one's a little bit more his style and so those are kind of the ways that we will help them work to get their food and to wear them mentally out a little bit because with rex is not just physical exercise i'll tell you right now if you think you can wear out a husky physically I, good luck to you unless you're a marathon runner um then you might stand a chance which most of us i know and myself i am not so getting him so he can you know mentally be worn out is one of the things that we need to work on um, and that's one of the things that he has started to do and again, like I said, right now he is available for adoption and we're really screening and working on finding him the right home so he can live out the rest of his life as the family pet that he deserves to be. Um, you know, and one of the things when he did come in, he was, you know, didn't have any vaccinations, wasn't neutered, microchipped. So those are all things that we have also done, you know, with the adoptions, which we do for all our animals. So that way, you know, he, he it sets him up for life on there. All right, Rex says I'm gonna find all those treats. Oh, he said I heard a phone. <laughs> all right, guys. Andrew, you wanna go back to you? Or you wanna yeah. some I was photos? saying like talk about, you know, that is focus. You know, it's, he had a yes. total squirrel moment right there. Uh, <laughs> I know when I first adopted my dog, 
Um, that was one of the first things that Amanda taught me um, and one of our other behaviorists, Wendy, was focused in, um, in that touch and that um, was, was really great, um, especially getting into like that situations and things like that. Uh, hey, Amanda, if we can come back to you really quick, uh, can you talk, um, if you don't want to do it right there, feel free to, to step outside and put the camera back on you. Um, can you talk a bit more about the cats? Uh, and kind of how that TLC part um, has evolved, because that's something that's relatively new um, in the TLC world, is uh, taking care of cats that maybe quite aren't feral um, and getting them uh, better adoptable as well. All right. Yeah, we can talk about the cats. I don't know if you have some photos of, of some of our TLC cats. Um, you know, with cats, they're sometimes a little bit different. So cats are usually a lot of its adjustment periods for them um, and getting them comfortable and feeling safe on there. Sometimes it's just handling with the cats. You know, they can, we get a variety um, that comes in, whether their owner surrendered, so the owners have brought them into us, or if it's a cat who has been astray. Um, so meaning we don't know, the, we can't, you know, we're looking, we couldn't find owners for them, the, whether a good Samaritan found them or somebody or animal control officers have brought them into us. I work on the squeaky ball. Um, so, you know, we do, we'll try to do a lot. I know there was a picture a second ago. Oh, that one's um, some of our enrichments. So we began trying to find things to keep our, our animals busy. So that's one of, one of our days for, it was actually on Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving. They did some, some really yummy treats and frozen up for all the shelter dogs on Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know if you want to go back to the cat harness, unleash one. So this little guy came to us. Um, he actually ended up on bike quarantine um, and I was getting notifications from staff that he was attacking them. <laughs> so he actually ended up coming and staying in our office for a good month or so where we worked on those behaviors. Uh, and things with him, we, you know, we, we taught him how to walk on harness. We actually clicker trained him um, on there along with other enrichments and trainings and help redirecting the biting because he bit pretty hard. Um, and you know, it was a playful, it was never aggressive. It was just a kitten who had no boundaries. Uh, and so that's one of the, you know, one of the many things that we've worked with. So if you want to flip through some of the other, might be a couple of more pictures of cats. I just, <laughs> and then, yeah, just, you know, again, Richmond's playing with them. He yeah, like that he would entertain himself. And so we would set up different playstations for him on there. I don't know if there's any more to kind of go over. If you had any other questions on some other things that we do, we have staff who is, who are phenomenal with the cats and we're actually working on getting them more training and in depth for them to be able to do more with our cats so it's been something really great to be able to grow that program and not just the dogs but also the cats yeah man i completely agree um i've heard from a few people who have had great success with getting those cats that um like i said just needed a little um just a little extra handling. So thanks for, you know, touching on that a little bit. That's fantastic. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Connors, we're going to come to you and we're going to talk about our very special girl. Let's talk a little bit about Winnie. Um, and just, I know Scott mentioned it at the beginning, but just to kind of reiterate, um, that, uh, just kind of viewer discretion, there's one particular photo, just, uh, just kind of keep, um, know that it's coming. Uh, it's not graphic by any means. Um, and there's a lot of cuteness, so trust me, it'll counteract it. So Dr. Connors, uh, I'll put up some pictures and throw it to you. Okay, so yes, we are going to talk about Winnie, and I think some of you probably saw her very cute photo on the email invitation that you got. And um, as, as several other people have mentioned, um, that's a cute photo. Uh, Winnie's case, I call rated H for horrific. Um, we deal with things here, uh, particularly as veterinarians, that, that range from the unpleasant to the repulsive. And her case is really more towards the latter. So just be forewarned. Um, Winnie came to us as a stray found in Soledad in late October. Um, the first thing I noticed about her, other than that really cute face, was she, there was just an awful odor to her. And um, as I started examining her, 
I could see that it appeared that someone had poured some sort of liquid, and, and I'm thinking it was something like coconut oil, on her back and down the back of her thighs. Um, I think maybe she has uh, a skin problem and somebody, whoever owned her, because somebody definitely did own her, um, somebody was probably trying to help her. But what that substance did was it started an infection and it attracted flies to her. If you remember, the weather in October was still pretty warm around here. So um, that became a problem because the presence of flies resulted in a maggot infestation. The medical term for that is myiasis. And that specifically means a parasitic infection of a live animal by fly larvae, otherwise known as maggots. Maggots feed on infected tissue, and if there's enough of them present, they can really debilitate an animal. In veterinary medicine, it's much more common to see maggots in large animals. Um, kind of the, the poster animal for myiasis is sheep, and they get something called tail rot, um, where as their wool grows more and more and gets matted with urine and fecal material, it attracts flies and they get a maggot infestation. So what were we gonna do with poor Winnie? Um, can you put up the, the next photo, please? So the treatment is to manually remove the maggots. So here's a picture of us shaving the fur and um, the, the nastiness is pixelated out there. Um, but all of that was covered with hundreds of maggots. Um, she had maggots burrowing into her skin and so we needed to remove all of that fur, pluck off any maggots that were remaining, clean the infected tissue, which included a medicated bath, which was her in the previous picture that you saw there after she was shaved. She was pretty debilitated, so we hydrated her, we got her on several different antibiotics, and, um, just had to, had to give her time. She was exhausted, she was anemic, she would not eat for several days. She has no teeth, um, so that complicated things just a little bit. Um, but Andrea, I'm gonna pick her up right now. Where is Lizzie? Come on, honey, honey. Oh. But here she is in the flesh. Hi. She got lots of TLC from, from our staff because as, as she started feeling better and getting stronger and deciding what it was she wanted to eat, which is really just Caesars, um, her personality really came out. Um, and she's just a delightful little dog. She's house trained. Um, after she got stronger, um, we spayed her. And after that, uh, she has been fostered by Gina, our HRVP. It's been a couple of weeks she's been in Gina's home, and uh, Gina says she's the perfect little guest. Huh? Can I get you up there, honey bunny? Um, Gina is going to be taking her home, but she will be made available for adoption fairly soon. Um, as I said earlier, I do think she has an underlying skin problem. She does need to be professionally groomed. Um, she needs a really good professional clipping, but she is a dog who's going to need um, probably medicated baths on a regular basis, a really good diet, which I guess it's going to be Caesars, isn't it? Huh? And, um, and just some, some good TLC. As I said, we do think she is about 10, but this breed of dog, this little Shih Tzu, they tend to live to be 14, 15, 16 years old. So we think she definitely has some good time left with her. Don't you? Huh? 
she's being a little shy right now. She's not quite sure what's going on. There you go, honey. Well, it's a good thing I have a few other pictures of her because I can't not share this one. Look at that face. And then um, we also have Jen, uh, Gina shared a few others that she had <laughs> taken of Winnie. <laughs> and no one can say that dogs are not spoiled when they go to Gina's house. <laughs> Although the side eye right there is saying maybe the bow's too much. I don't know. I cannot speak for her. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Connors. You Thanks, are Winnie. Welcome. She's being very shy right now. Which is great because I will have Jenny, I'm gonna spotlight you because now Cinderella decided to come out. And is she gonna go away now? Did I ruin the moment? You guys are having a moment. I did. Sorry. As, That's all right. as she's trying to jump off. She is um a little camera shy. <laughs> This little girl just went back into her crate. She she doesn't want any of you. <laughs> she is kind of giving a look. She's like, I'm not sure. Uh, she's sniffing the computer. Oh, I'm pressing buttons. <laughs> she is the sweetest little thing, though. Oh. And then look, there's Lucy again with Amanda. I love it. Uh, so we're going to switch over to our um, kind of question and answer period. So again, if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box and, and we will ask them of, of our panelists. But I also have, like I said, some questions um, before uh, that we can, can ask as well. Um, so Jenny, we did have a really great question that I'm gonna throw um, to you for well, both of us. Um, What's our kind of our status with volunteers right now? Are we accepting new volunteers? Do we have volunteers on site? Where are we at? So with our TLC program, we we do have volunteers on site. We have dog, dog walkers that come in. Um, they do play a very vital role with the animals that are, are staying with us in the shelter. Um, they're getting them out. They're exercising them. They're stimulating them mentally so they're not just deteriorating in a kennel. Um, and they're providing other types of enrichments as well. Our TLC volunteers um, work very closely with our behavior team and our animal care team. So, and we do also have, um, so we have them both in the cat area and the dog areas. Um, we do have um, some, we have onboarded a few new volunteers um, in our clinic to help down there because businesses um, booming. Lots of people signing up for vaccinations and spay and neuter, so um, they're helping us down there. Um, we did have volunteers up in our wildlife center during our busy season, um, but things have quieted down, so many of them um, are back home. Sorry, <laughs> she's trying to climb up my leg now. <laughs> Cinderella is very entertaining. <laughs> that does not feel very great. <laughs> Um, but in most other areas, we're not onboarding um, volunteers currently. And if any of the, our callers, um, if any of you are interested in volunteering, please feel free to reach out to me uh, via email or you can call me. My information is in the emails that you receive for the Yappy Hour. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can get you in contact with, um, with people, give you more information or, or anything like that. Um, all right, so let's go to another question here. Um, Dr. Connors, I'm going to come up to you. You talked a little bit um, about, you know, how we treat our animals. Are there specific things like therapies uh, that we can do to help certain animals? Um, this one, uh, the question is specifically paralyzed, which just brought to mind, and I'm completely blanking on her name. It was that a little poodle that had fallen from the landing. There was quite a bit of work that we did for that dog. 
So can you talk about uh, a little bit more of what we can do in that sense? I can. Um, and, and like so many things in life, but definitely in medicine, is um, it depends. It really depends on the injury. Um, the little poodle that you mentioned uh, jumped off of a second story landing and um, was paralyzed from the neck down when, when he arrived. And um, he was so darn cute and young and otherwise healthy that I felt like we just needed to give him a chance. Um, I know that a lot of other shelters would have said, this is a paralyzed dog, he's gonna be euthanized. Um, but some simple treatments, uh, some steroid injections, some really good nursing care, and he had a very padded um, kennel with potty pads, and he was turned numerous times a day. He was hungry, he had no trouble eating and drinking, we bathed him. Um, and with him, it, it was time. Um, he just needed a, a a fair amount of time to start healing. And when he got to a certain point where he was ready for a little bit more intensive rehab, um, he went to uh, the program that Amanda initiated, our Rough Start program down at um, the uh, Salinas Valley State Prison. And uh, the, the inmates there were able to work with him um, basically, he needed to be able to do stairs. That's, he needed to build up his muscles. And so they have stairs down there and they worked with him. I set up a, a whole rehabilitation plan and he got much stronger. And they also worked with him behaviorally, doing a lot of training. And after a number of weeks of him being there, he came back and he was adopted pretty immediately. Um, we do have some animals who, as Scott mentioned earlier, come to us and, and they're just, they're really broken. And um, it can be really difficult initially to figure out who do we, who's too broken. Um, and that, that really just comes from experience of, of doing this for a long time. Um, but some of you may recall, uh, it's been pretty much exactly two years now, we had a dog named Penny. Um, if any of you remember Penny, she was a beautiful little um, copper-colored pit bull who came to us almost completely paralyzed in the back end. Um, but, but after two days, when I examined her again, I already saw signs in her, her uh, neurologic signs were improving. And so we worked with her physically. She's another dog that Amanda um, fostered in her home for a while and really worked with her with some physical therapy um, equipment. We also took Penny to natural veterinary therapy down in Carmel um, to do the underwater treadmill. She had acupuncture done and she did really, really well and uh, was adopted by a wonderful young man in Santa Cruz. Um, so yes, I mean, th those are a couple of our um, success stories. And I wish I could say that we had more, but sometimes, especially with neurologic problems, um, there's just not a lot that we can do. We try if we think that we can help these animals, but there's, there's quite a few that we just can't help. And honestly, uh, for them, humane euthanasia is the kindest thing that we can do. Yeah, that's very true. Very true, Dr. Connors. Thank you so much. Um, so this is gonna be kind of a round table. So I would love everybody to take a little shot um, at answering this because I feel like we'll have different um, answers from kind of different areas. Uh, so Amanda, we'll start with you and then Jenny, and then we'll come with Dr. Connors as well. Uh, so the question is, how do we decide when a cat or a dog is ready for the adoption floor? So Amanda, if you could talk about that uh, from the behavior standpoint, and then Jenny, a bit more of kind of like, I guess, the logistics of it. 
Okay, um, as far as what, you know, when we are dealing with a dog or cat with behavior issues and we're working with them, what we'll do is we'll put a protocol together, what we want to, you know, do, what our goals are for this animal, and what, you know, what kind of our markers are. And we'll kind of, what we'll do is we'll typically, depending on the animals, usually it's once a week. It can be more, it can be every few days, it, you know, we kind of change it where we reevaluate where that animal's at. And if we need to change up their protocols, if we need to change up their handling, if we need to, you know, what progress we're seeing, what progress we're not seeing. And then we, you know, we, we our team will meet, we'll discuss our plan, and then we'll go ahead and move forward. And then once we feel the animal is ready to go into a home and what we're looking for is, you know, will this, you know, are they ready to, to be able to, will they adjust to a new home? Is that behavior something that an adopter can work with? You know, we, we want it to be where that where it can succeed. And depending on the behaviors, uh, is what we'll look at as far as what we're um, going to do. We we do a lot of follow up with our TLC animals with phone calls. Uh, a lot of times we work on getting them set up in classes and training so we can continue with the animals so that way they can succeed. Um, so it really does vary. It's not, there's no time limit on when it can be. Sometimes these animals will be, it can be super quick and where we see, you know, a really quick turnaround where it could be a week, two weeks, or it could be where we're looking at a month or two, you know, depending on what those behaviors are. Okay, hey, Jenny. So, similar, yeah. It, it might make more sense if I go and then you talk more about some of the logistics. Sure. Is that okay? So um, following up from Amanda and, and the behavior aspects, um, medical is, some of, the, some of our cases are pretty cut and dried. Um, we treated the animal's wounds or illness and they're better and, and they're ready to go up for adoption. Um, some animals are a little bit more of a question mark. Um, we had just a few weeks ago an older German Shepherd dog who had horrific uh, hip dysplasia and um, was going to need some some real care as she continued to age. And uh, we contacted a um, senior Tulani, the senior German Shepherd dog rescue, and they took her in and. Um, we did everything here. We spayed her, we did blood work, we did x-rays, we did all of that. So they had the, all that information and they took her in and um, they've got a lot of people who are really interested in adopting older German Shepherd dogs and they were able to find her a home in a couple of weeks. Um, another example is uh, we had a, a hound dog, I named him Hank, um, who came in with skin issues and and he was probably about 11 or 12 years old and we got his skin looking better got him on better food and i thought gosh who who's going to want this guy you know he's 12 years old with some skin issues and he's a hound and he bays like a hound and honestly he was on the website and within 12 hours somebody adopted him and it was somebody who was specifically looking for a senior dog so you know, we, we never, we just never know. Um, sometimes when I think that an animal medically is going to require a lot of resources from a client, I'm really surprised at what our local community steps up to. And it's, sorry. <sighs> sorry. Anybody who knows me knows I get very emotional about the animals that we take care of um, because we work really hard with them. And Jenny, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. And, and we couldn't do what we do without this group of people on this call. and. Um, I feel like Dr. Connors is gonna make me feel emotional. 
um, <laughs> because everybody, um, er well, everybody here obviously cares about the outcome of you know these animals and what happens. Um, <laughs> sorry, you got me too. <laughs> Um, anyway, we just really feel grateful and appreciative that we get to be part of this and that we are part of such an amazing organization that does so much for these animals. Um, like other people have said on this call, there are so many other shelters that don't want anything to do with this work because it's hard. It's not easy. Anytime you give up a foster animal, it's hard. Lots of us have kids. Our kids, you know, are heartbroken sometimes. Our other pets bond with these animals, but we know that we take them on for a short period of time, we make them well, we find them a new home, and then our home is free again for another foster animal. If we kept every animal that came into our home, well, we would have to call <laughs> our human investigators on ourselves, <laughs> probably. Um, but there, you know, we all have limits, our homes all have limits, and giving these foster animals up to another member of this community means we can just keep on going. So anyway, huge thank you to everybody on this call. Thank you for letting us be part of this work. Andrea, this is Scott. Can I jump in for a second? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Always. Uh, well, I figure I give I give our staff time to to blow their nose and wipe their eyes and and uh, talk about something that I wanted to mention a little bit earlier. And it was when Amanda was talking, and you saw some of the footage of the facility that she mentioned. The behavior team had taken over. We call that Red's Barn. Some of you know it. Um, it's the original the original barn. Um, and that has become our special place for the animals that need that, that specialized behavior work. Um, what I like to say is Amanda and her team have done an incredible job turning that into a useful space. Um, it's far from perfect. It's far from even okay, <laughs> I like to say. Uh, we have an incredible clinic. We have a great adoption center. We have a great wildlife center. We have a wonderful barn. And we have this space for what is arguably among our most important work that it really is inadequate. Um, we have temporary kennels in there that have long outlived their lifespan. We have no HVAC system in there. Um, the outside areas in that space are dirt and wood. So wood, really hard to, dis impossible to disinfect. Um, and, and dirt is okay when it's not raining. When it is, it turns into mud, which makes it hard for us to exercise the dog. So that has become an area that we've looked at as one that we need to upgrade. And that'll be um, a project for us in the next, um, in the near future. Um, the, what we often do in our field is we'll look at other shelters, just as other shelters have looked at our adoption center. When they want to rebuild their adoption center, they look to see what we've created and they improve on it, just like we did when we built our adoption center. Um, the interesting thing about this work is that there aren't any models out there for us to look at because a lot of shelter or most shelters aren't, they don't have an entire team devoted to making animals better behaviorally. There are, I don't say there are no models out there, there are one or two models out there for us to look at. Um, so that makes it both challenging and exciting because we're going to be doing something that not many people are doing, and hopefully we'll have other shelters coming to us to look at our new space when it's built to see what we've done to see how we've carved out this incredible resource and space where we house our our behavior animals away from all the other animals to give them a quiet space a, a space where staff can focus on their needs so that is a project we're real excited about and i wasn't really stalling for time i i think it was important for for you all to hear about that um, because i know you care about what we do and you enable us to do all the things that we do. So I will, I will give it back to Andrea, and I think there are probably a few more questions. Thank you, Scott. That was a kind of a great little segue, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, that's actually- for that. I just saw a question. There will be a campaign for that. We're not, we're not quite ready. We're still in, uh, um, in a phase where uh, we're, we're, not, we're not reaching out, but that will come. Yeah. 
Uh, that's actually kind of all we had for right now. I know that there were a couple of questions that we uh, weren't able to get to. Um, so if you have additional questions, please feel free to, again, just email me. Uh, Dan, thank you for that. I will uh, get that information to you. Um, but if any other questions that um, popped up that you want answers to, again, email me, reach out at any time. Um, and I know, Scott, you just did a, a little kind of thank you for that, but um, I'll leave the final words uh, to you, sir. Oh, thank you very much. I, I know everyone is so busy this time of the year. There's a lot going on. And we just can't thank you enough for taking an hour out of your day to learn about this work. That I mean, I think you can tell how, how passionate we are about it, how much we care, and to have you give up your time um, because you care too means, means so much to us. Again, we can't do this work without you. We have contributions um, from all kinds of people, all sizes, and it all matters and it all makes the work possible. So thank you very much. Yep, couldn't say it any better. So thanks everybody. Uh, like I said, we'll get this recording out to y'all uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody. Bye.